This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so hello everybody again. And I uh, wanted to discuss, we will not have lunch and learn next week. There will be Purim day. We'll be busy enough with our Purim dis deliveries and Suda and all else that goes on with Purim. So uh, we will devote this week to a, a very interesting aspect of Purim. And, you know, we, we, look at, we look at the Torah holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the high holidays, and then we have Sukkot, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot. We have all of these Torah-level holidays. And then we look at Hanukkah and Purim, which are the rabbinically instituted holidays. And they are, yeah, they are the rabbinic holidays as we look at them. But there really is a fascinating aspect of Purim that we'll see some sources as we go through that Purim is referred to as the eternal holiday, meaning other holidays will be eclipsed at a certain point, but not Purim. Purim will remain. And by studying these sources, I think we'll get a very important insight into Purim and an insight that hopefully will, will impact our day-to-day -day living, day-to-day -day life, and day-to-day -day understanding and acceptance of different events that happen that often swirl around us. So without further ado, let us begin over here with source number one from Rabbi Mordechai Becher, Gateway to Judaism. And as I say each time that I quote him, uh, this is a book that is on the study list of anyone who is in a conversion to Judaism proce uh, process. And it's a book that, uh, yeah, that would offer much, I think, to everybody, even those of all the Jews from birth would do all the curriculum that the Jews of choice go through, um, this world would be a pretty amazing place. So the Jewish world would be a pretty amazing place. Okay, good. Welcome Cheryl, Leah, and Ateret. So let's go to our first source here. The Purim story begins about 900 years after the exodus from Egypt. The Jews had been living in Israel continuously since they first entered with Joshua for 410 years. King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem had been the focal point of the Jewish spiritual and, nat and national life in Israel. And this is so important to keep in mind. You know, we live in a world of narratives. We live in a world where there is so much disinformation and, and this whole idea that, oh, the state of Israel was established as a result of the Holocaust, right, is, or, 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 you know, the state of Israel or the Jews coming to Israel was as a result of the Holocaust. That was, that is such a, a false narrative and such a dangerous narrative. We returned to Israel. The nations of the world allowed us to return to Israel and agreed to set up, the United Nations agreed to set up a Jewish part of what was then British Mandate Palestine and an Arab part of what was then British Mandate Palestine. That came on the heels of the Holocaust, but it's us, v'shavu banim livulam. It was us returning back to our land, returning back to our place to our land where we were the only ones who actually had Jerusalem as a capital city and that had been an independent before the British. It was the Turk, it was uh, Turkey had for close to 400 years. The first major tragedy the Jewish people of this era experienced was the division of the country into the Northern Kingdom of Israel and the Southern Kingdom of Judea. This took place there was a united kingdom under Saul, Saul under, Dov, under David, under Shlomo, under David and King Solomon. But after the death of Solomon, Shlomo, when his son Rehavim was meant to take over, the kingdom split into two, 
areas, the northern kingdom of Israel, right, the Malchut Yisrael and Malchut Yehuda, the southern kingdom of Judea. The northern kingdom was populated by 10 of the 12 tribes. It was eventually invaded by the Assyrians under Sancheriv, who exiled the Jews, the 10 lost tribes, as we refer to them. Sancheriv's policy of forced exile and assimilation directly caused the loss of the 10 tribes to the Jewish people. Less than 100 years later, the Jews were dealt another terrible blow, this time the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar invaded Israel, destroyed the temple. The temple was part of the kingdom of Judea and exiled almost all of the remaining tribes, Judah, Binyamin, and the priests and the Levites, to Babylon, modern-day Iraq. Jeremiah the prophet had warned that there would be destruction and exile, but he also predicted that the Jews would return to Israel rebuild the temple and their home and their homeland. Yirmiyo, Jeremiah even put a date on the return declaring that the temple we built set would be rebuilt 70 years after its destruction. Nevertheless, there were many who did not believe that they would ever return to Israel, felt the exile signified the end of the special relationship between God and the Jewish people. The Jews quickly became acclimated to the conditions of the exile and built a well-organized Jewish community in Babylon, present-day Iraq, and neighboring Persia, modern-day Iran. Okay? And it was at the end of this 70-year exile that the story of Esther, Megillat Esther, the story of Purim takes place. And as he mentioned, not only were Jews thinking that maybe this might be it, but the Gentiles also. We mentioned in our Tuesday morning class that the start of the Megillah is this party Achashverosh that he threw on the third year of his reign. Why the third year of his reign? Because he miscalculated the 70 years and thought the 70 years are up, the Jews have not been redeemed, the Jews will not be redeemed. And therefore he made this party as a celebration of that. And years earlier, years earlier, Belshazzar made a party when he celebrated what he thought was the conclusion of the 70 years without the Jews being redeemed. And the famous handwriting on the wall expression comes from what actually was handwriting on the wall over there, takal taka um, mana mana takal tavar, which was deciphered to mean the vessels of the temple you have taken and you will be destroyed. And in fact, he was assassinated that very night. So this is taking place at the very end of this Babylonian exile. The Gemara has a very strange question. The Gemara asks, the Gemara in Chulin, Esther min Torah minayin. The Gemara of Megillah also quotes this. Where is Esther found in the Torah? Now, of course, Esther took place long after the, the end of the Torah, right, which is before we entered the land of Israel. And this was close to 900 years, or more than 900 years after that. Close, actually over a thousand years after that was the end of the Babylonian exile. But the Gemara is asking a much deeper question. The Gemara is asking, when do the events of Esther, when does, where does the teachings of the whole Purim episode that Esther led where is that alluded to in the Torah? And the Gemara answers, vanochi haster astir panai bayomahu. I will hide, I will surely hide my panay, my countenance on that day. And as we've explained before, this is not simply a play on words. Oh, how about that? Haster astir sounds like Esther. No. It's about the actual events that were taking place, that I will hide my face. This is at the end of the Babylonian exile. 
and we were becoming detached, as Rabbi Becker had mentioned. And, and we thought maybe we might be cast off. And to add, this was the period when prophecy was coming to an end. And therefore, we might, we might have felt that we were now adrift without our connection to Hashem. And therefore, it lets us know this is the period that the Pasuk in Devarim was referring to, I will hide my face from you. You will not see me. When I hide my face, you don't see me, but I am right there. And I see all that is going on. And that's the message. Hastir, Hastir, you can't see my face, but I'm right here. And that's what Hashem was saying and letting us know that even in this bitter exile that we were in and this seemingly loss of our connection to God, that's not the case. I am there, though my face might be hidden, I am there. And source number three, Rabbi Shimshon Pincus writes as follows, we'll take it in the English this is also the reason for which none of the names of God are mentioned in the Gilat Esther, right? It says, HaMelech HaChashverosh, King HaChashverosh. It also says HaMelech. And when it says HaMelech, the king, without adding the name HaChashverosh, on a deeper level, it is alluding to God. But it is the only book of our entire scripture where God, God's name is not explicitly mentioned. Not God's name, not any other of God's names. Not Hashem, Yud Kei Vav Kei, not Aleph Dalen Nun Yud, not Elohim. None of Hashem's names are mentioned. And this is very, very important. If his name would be written explicitly, this would constitute a departure from the natural into the supernatural. That is applicable to Passover. Passover, Pesach, it was 10 plagues. It was Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt. It was the splitting of the sea. It was the supernatural. Purim, however, reveals that each aspect within nature is imbued with the love of God. Right? Actually, the Hebrew is even better. Ach Purim Megalalanu, Purim reveals to us, Shekol Davar Betocha Teva HaChashuch, every matter that is within this dark nature, this, do- this seemingly dark natural events, Zohi Pisgat HaAva, that is the zenith, that is the epitome of God's love. Where do we find God's intense love more? The Purim of Pesach. Purim of Pesach. The Chagat Pesach. On Passover, go back to the English, God raised us over the entire world. About the Purim, but on Purim, we discover God in every nook and cranny of the natural world. The festival of Purim reveals not only the great love that is aroused at a time of danger, which was, of course, a terrible time of danger during the time of Purim, but it goes much further than that. But even the inner nature of the world, the thoughts that we must think when we drink a cup of water and recite a blessing over it, even the simple things in in the world, Megillat Esther reveals the incredible closeness that God maintains within this natural world. The power, the essence of Purim is found within this natural world in which we live. And that is the most powerful lesson for us that Purim takes us and brings us to. And that it took place during the time when we didn't longer had the prophecy. And we no longer were going to have these 
overt miracles. But seeing Hashem in the natural is the most powerful lesson that we have. As Rav Hutner Zatzpal expounds further, Rav Hutner says, Mashal Lifshnei Bnei Adam. We can compare it to two people, and they were commanded, they must recognize people at night. You must identify people in the dark. One of them lit a candle, the English used a flashlight, and looked at the faces of the people in order to recognize their faces. The second one did not have a light, a flashlight, or a candle. But he had to recognize who they were, who they were. How could he do that without light? He had to train himself, teach himself, by understanding and recognizing their voices. In the shul where I grew up, there was a wonderful man who I loved very much, an older man by the name of Mr. Herman Schechter, who was blind. And it was amazing. Whenever we would go greet Mr. Schechter on Shabbos, he, I'd say, good Shabbos, Mr. Schechter. Oh, Eugene, how are you? Welcome. So good to hear. So good to hear your voice. Thank you for coming over. My brother, oh, Josh, great. What was really amazing was my older brothers who were away at colleges, who weren't necessarily there every week, They'd say, hello, Mr. Shechta. Oh, Marty. Oh, Shelley. Whoever it was, he recognized everyone's voice. He, because of his blindness, he had trained himself to hear the voices and know exactly who it was. When it came to that clarity and that and that feeling for that cert, that, that certainty. They had the first one, they, they had the right person. The first one had a better, more definite means of, ident of, of identification than the second one. That which we see overrides that which we hear. But on the other hand, the second one who recognized the voices has an advantage over the first one. Shehu sigel atzmo kishron chadash. He had developed a new ability. Shal hakshava, to listen carefully, to discern, lekolo, the sounds of b'nei adam, of people. Ma'arijan shenishtamish b'nei archaselo kishron zeh shal hakarai deichush hashmiya. The other one never developed. The first one never developed. That sensitivity, that ability to discern. After this evening, when the sun rises, the first one will extinguish his candle or turn off his flashlight. The Sharga Batira Mayahani, what good is that flashlight, is that candle in the, in the afternoon? All, right? Or, there were no kochot. There are no abilities that he had gained by his nighttime activity that's going to help him now. However, the second fellow, Granted, now he can see, but the skill in recognizing those voices that is a skill that he developed in the dark that will help him even by the day. And so too, those skills that we developed as a nation during the darkness of Purim are skills that we take with us throughout the generations. And that is so fundamentally crucial to our survival as a nation, to recognize that we have not been set adrift and that God is there in all of the events that take place, the wonderful, the horrific. There is God's involvement in everything that takes place. 
which brings us to the eternity of Purim. The Navi Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, says, Lachain, behold, Hinei yamim ba'im, days are coming, Neum Hashem, says God. Velo yomar od, and we will no longer say, Chai Hashem, by the life of God, Asher helap in Israel, that he took us out from the Eretz of Shrayim, from the land of Egypt, right? A month after, Pe- after Purim, we have our Pesach, where we go through the Pesach Seder, and the exodus from Egypt, the wonderful exodus from Egypt, we will no longer be lauding that event. Ki'im. Rather, what will we be speaking about? Chai Hashem. Asher he'elad b'nei Yisrael. Me'eretz safon. Umikola aratzot. Wow, God, by the life of God that he brought us, he brought us, the children of Israel, from the lands to the north. Umikola aratzot, from all the lands. Asher hidicham shama, where we have been scattered. Vahashevotim alad matam, and he has brought us back to the land. Asher natati laavotam, that I gave, speaking the name of God, that I gave to their fathers. And that is actually the world that we are living in. Right? When, when the state of Israel uh, began, and the Jews, I believe, from Yemen were brought. And it was either Yemen or Morocco, I forget where, or I think I forget exactly where this story is. But they were, they had never seen airplanes. They thought this was, and it really was, they were, they were more correct than we. This was the fulfillment of the prophecy that I'll bring you on the wings of eagles. It got a little bit crazy because it got very cold on the plane. And they started to make a fire on the plane to warm up. That's how unfamiliar they were with this modern technology. And then we've seen over time the, the, the streaming to Israel of the Jewish people from all over the world. And we had from the Soviet Union tremendous influx when the Iron Curtain finally fell. And today we're having a tremendous influx from Ukraine as the Iron Curtain tries to uh, drape itself once again, right? But we have all these events, but ultimately, Yermio is saying, Jeremiah is saying, when the full Geula, when the full redemption will take place, we're not going to speak about the Exodus anymore, but we're going to speak about the ingathering and that Geula the Medrash number six on Mishlei says, Shekol HaMoadim Yihiyu B'Teilim. Incredible. All the festivals will ultimately become Batel. They will become nullified. In the time of the Zman Mashiach, V'yemei HaPurim Lo Yihiyu Nivtalim La'olam. But the days of Purim will never, never become batel. Shenemar, as it says in Esther, V'yemei ha-purim ha-eila lo yavru mitoch ha-yudim v'zichram lo yasuf mi zaram. These days of Purim will never leave the Jewish people. V'zichram and their memory, lo yasuf, will never reach its end from its zaram, from its descendants. And very interesting, the Gemara tells us that Esther was written, it was written by Mordechai and Esther, and it was written with what we call Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach HaKodesh is divine inspiration. And the Gemara tries to bring many different proofs of how we know that it was written with divine inspiration. Haman said in his heart, who does the king want to honor more than I? How do we know? How did Mordechai know what Haman said in his heart? It must have been divine inspiration. The Gemara says, not necessarily. Maybe from the fact that Haman gave all of these lavish lavish, uh, steps that would need to be taken, it was clear he was thinking about himself. Oh, it says the Jews did not take from any of 
the spoils of battle. How can Mordechai have known that? Must be Ruach HaKodesh? No. Maybe they sent out messengers. Esther found favor in the eyes of all that saw her. How do you know that, Ruach HaKodesh? Not necessarily. The fact that everyone was speaking about her and trying to take credit, she must be, she would not reveal her nationality. So everyone said, oh, she must be from Irvine. The LA people said, no, she must be from LA. So everyone's trying to take ownership of her. That means everyone, and the Gemara goes through each of these different proofs as saying that, oh, it was Ruach HaKodesh. And each one, right, Mordechai knew the assassination the assassination plot of Big Tan and Teresh. How did he know? Must be Ruach HaKodesh? Not necessarily. Mordechai was a member of the Sanhedrin. He spoke 70 languages. They were conversing in their language, thinking no one else knew it. And that's so the Gemara shoots down every proof that Esther was written, the Megillat Esther was written with Ruach HaKodesh, divine inspiration, except for this Pasuk. This Pasuk, which says that it will never leave the Jewish people. That, how do you know? How can he say these Purim, days of Purim, will never leave the Jewish people? Their memory, how can Mordechai write such a thing? Unless he was writing it with what we call Ruach HaKodesh. Only because he was writing it with this divine inspiration. That's how he knew that it would never, never leave. And never leave was saying even in the time of Mashiach. And we'll see a little further on this. But understand, like we said before, Pesach was wonder, it was miraculous. And Matan Torah, Shavuot, receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai, was miraculous. And Sukkot, our 40 years in the desert with the man falling from the heaven and the clouds overhead and the wellspring of water accompanying us. Miraculous, miraculous, miraculous. But if you want to measure miraculous, then the ultimate coming of Mashiach and all that which will accompany that, it will be far more miraculous. It will outshine all of these other miraculous holidays. But Purim is not about this supernatural event that took place. Purim is about seeing God involved in everything that takes place. You know, you, you, you go somewhere, you had an appointment, and they don't bother calling you to tell you that what you went there for is not ready. It'll take another hour, it'll take another two hours. And we can get all angry and frustrated. What do you mean? Why didn't you call? Or we could be somewhat, we, we, we could and should point out to them in the future, if I have an appointment and I don't live very close to here, so please make sure to let me know in advance that it's not going to be ready, right? We should do that so they should learn and improve the way they do things. But ultimately, the tsar that we're having, for whatever reason, is orchestrated from the heavens. And the way that I try to look at those events is, okay, it's a waste of time. It was a waste of gas, which has gotten pretty expensive these days, right? But thank God I'm healthy. My wife is healthy. The kids are healthy. The community is healthy. You know, if this is the tsar, everybody has to have a certain degree of tsar. We're learning in Derech Hashem. This world is meant to be a place of choices, of difficulties, of challenges. If this is the challenge that's coming my way and everyone is healthy, I don't want to say bring it on. We don't ask for tsar, but I'll accept it. That's what Purim is. Purim is recognizing not this supernatural event, which will become um, eclipsed by the messianic time, but it's recognizing the simple events in our life and appreciating the God hand in all of that. I mentioned Derech Hashem, so it's good to quote source number seven from the Ramchal, the author of Moshe Chaim Lutzato, the author of Derech Hashem that we're learning Monday nights. We're back to a quarter to six this week as we change the clock this Saturday night, quarter to six to 6.30. Also the classic 
Mesilat Yesharim, Path of the Just. And he writes, Bechol Mida Umida, Shuid Barak Shmo Every single action that God deals out to us. Navchin Shnei Inyanim. There are two aspects that we can discern. Hanir Vahanistar. The revealed and the hidden. The revealed is what we see. Vahanistar. But the hidden aspect, Hia Eitzaha is the deep design, plan. Haninsait Tamid Vachomidotav, which is found constantly in everything that God does. Lavi Bahenat Abriot Litikun Haklali. To bring this world, to bring humanity to this perfected state. She'ein l'chamase katan o gadol. Nothing happens, big or small. She'ein tochiyut kavanato. That the inner intent, purpose, design is not l'tikun ha'shalem. There is nothing that is not for this tikun ha'shalem. L'takein olam v'malchut shakai. To bring about this perfection. And in the future, God will reveal to the eyes of Israel how each and every event fits into that mode, how each and everything that took place, even the afflictions, the tragedies, were all necessary steps in a hazmana to prepare. A hazmana is an invitation in modern Hebrew to bring about the tova, the ultimate good. And it was a preparation, a true preparation for the ultimate bracha, the ultimate blessing. Vihine, but behold, ata now, in our world, with our eyes, ain maaseh Hashem muvanim lanu klal. We do not. The actions of God are not understood by us at all. El shitchiyutam hu anireh. It is, like we said before, the nira and the nistar. It is the superficiality. It is the externality. That is all that we can see. But its true essence, what it's really doing, its real purpose, why God has orchestrated this, Mistater. Haster Astir. It is hidden from us. Esther, Haster Astir, Mistater, it is hidden. But the inner essence, this toch, is equal to to each and every event that takes place. Shekulam rak tov lo rak lao. They are all kulo, rak tov, only good, purely good, and no ra at all. Vizet eno nira umuvan ata vadai. And this vadai certainly, absolutely, is not seen and is not and cannot under, be understood by us with our limitations. Ach, however, la'atid lavo in that world to come and that time to come, zelafachot nirev nasig. That's we will be able to see and to comprehend. Echayu kulam misibo tachbulotav yidvarach amukot. How they were all kulam, every single one of them. Misibo tachulotav, God's plans, the steps he was taking, amukot, deeper than we can even hope to fathom, lehitiv lanu ba'acharayutenu, to do good for us in the very end. And that, my friends, is what Purim is all about. Let's see from the stiff Chaim of Chaim Freelander. Purim, how evil becomes part of the divine, a prelude to future times. Hamechanea Meshutaf, 
בין הגילויים לעתיד לבוא והגילויים של נס הפורים. So why is it? Why is it that all the other holidays will become eclipsed and will become batel, the way Yirmiyo, the Jeremiah the prophet said, but not Purim? The common denominator between the messianic revelations and the revelations of Purim is the understanding of how evil served as a means to bring about the revelation of God's unity. Even the worst evil, the most horrific of events, served, which he said, Vadai, we certainly can't understand it. And if he's saying that, he, if the Ramchal is saying he can't understand it, then a thousand times more so, we can't understand it. But the common denominator between the Messianic revelations and those of Purim is understanding, ultimately understanding, how evil served as a means to bring about the revelation of God's unity. Gilui Yichud is how he refers to it. The revelation of God's unity, meaning that nothing was happening beyond his will, his control, his providence. That everything develops as God wills it to, despite this overwhelming, ugly appearance of evil. This will be the revelation in the future that everyone will understand retroactively how all events were leading to the divine purpose, to Gilui Hayichud. This is also the revelation of Purim. Within the hidden actions, without overstepping the boundaries of natural events, the divine plan was revealed. And that we saw all the events. There are no miracles that we read about in the Megillah. But everything falls into place to be there. Vashti is put to death based on the advice of none other than Haman. Mamuchan, he's called at that point. Haman. And as a result, Haman is the one who actually helped to bring Esther into the palace. And before Haman rises to his most powerful position, Mordechai overhears the plans of Bigtan and Teresh and reports it to the king, to Esther, who reports it to the king in the name of Esther, in the name of Mordechai. And it's written down in the book of Chronicles. That's what the sages, the Chazal, refer to as the Refua Kodem Lamachala. The healing is in place before the illness before the malady actually takes place. And only then, through more, through the rise and then the, the gallows, the Pusik says that Mordechai prepared low for him, that Haman prepared low for him, right? So the simple reading is he prepared it for who? For Mordechai. But in fact, who did he prepare the gallows for? Low, for he himself. And everything falls into place without any explosions, without any miracles, without any splitting of the sea, without any plagues, without the mountain splitting, everything falls into place. This is also the revelation of Purim within the hidden actions. Without overstepping the boundaries of natural events, the divine plan was revealed. And that's what the Navi Yirmiyo said. All the holidays will be nullified. This means that because the future revelations of God will be so much greater than any of the previous one, consequently, all the earlier revelations will pale. They'll be eclipsed into insignificance. However, the revelation of Purim is different. It shares the same type of revelation as those of the future. The revelation of God's unity the revelation of everything that took place, there was this Hester, this Esther, this Hastir, Astir, there was this hidden aspect, this Tochiyut, as he referred to, this inner essence that everything was leading to the Bracha. Therefore, Purim will never be nullified, as the verse says, below Zichram lo Yasuf Mizaram. Their memory 
will never be lost from its zaram. Zaram, here they translate it as children, but zaram actually means seed, right? Which is a term we use for descendants. Descendants go far beyond children. That's going down throughout all of the generations. That is where this comes back to. So Purim, this seemingly inconsequential little holiday of ours, is really the holiday that will remain because it mirrors what will happen in the Messianic times. And it teaches us to look further, to look deeper. Someone at the, at the Jewish Journey class asked me, so Rabbi, what, why do we wear costumes on Purim, right? And it's not that we want to have a Jewish Halloween to give uh, the Jewish kids their chance to, uh, to dress up, though it is divine providence that Purim comes out a number of months after Halloween, so we can get all these, all these costumes for our kids on sale Right on the clear, on the clear, on, on the clear, on the clearance sales post Halloween, it works out beautifully. But the the costumes on Purim actually are related to this concept and are actually a very deep concept. Someone walks in in a costume. Someone's got a mask on. Where does your mind immediately go? Who is that? Who is that? Oh, is that so and so? No. Right, and we try to use all these different clues. Well, how tall is he or she? Right. Um, oh, that walk. Oh, I recognize that walk. I know who that is. It teaches us costumes, forces us to look deeper and to see behind the mask. And this world is a mask. It is a mask of haster, astir, panai, mikem. I will hide my face from you. This world is a mask behind which God hides. And it's our job, I forget which Hasidic Rebbe it was, that a child came to him crying. He said, my child, why are you crying? And he said, I'm playing hide and seek. And it was my turn to hide. And no one came to find me. And the Rebbe started to cry also. And the child said, Rebbe, why are you crying? And the Rebbe said, now I understand how Hashem feels when no one goes to find him. No one looks behind the mask. No one goes seeking to see Hashem's fingerprints on all that takes place. And therefore on Purim, we wear these masks, we wear these costumes, and everyone's wondering who's behind the mask to teach us, to train us like the mashal, the parable that Rav Hutner gave of at night, you learn to recognize the voices, to teach us to look deeper, to recognize that which we, that which we don't see openly before our very eyes. And that is why Purim will never, is the eternal holiday, will never stop and how Purim impacts our every day, our every day, our every encounter to appreciate and to accept and to embrace the Yad Hashem, the hand of Hashem, which takes place in everything that goes on around us and all that, hopefully all the good that we do. Okay, my friends, I will call it over here. Let's remember, be kind, be thoughtful, be generous, be grateful. We have a lot, a lot to be grateful for. Let us live that, that gratitude. Okay, my friends, I wish everybody a good Shabbos and a Purim Sameach. Um, we're, we're in full mode this Shabbos. We're having a beautiful bar mitzvah here. The shul is set up back in the way the shul was supposed to be set up. The shul used to be set up going back about two years. We are set up normally, fully again. Come see, come join, re-enter, re-enter. That's what we ask of everybody. Come home, come home. It's time to come home. Okay, and I wish everybody also Purim Sameach. Please do join us. We'll have Purim 
the Megillat Esther reading next week, Wednesday evening at 7.45, followed by a whole meal here at the shul, and also a bat mitzvah that will be taking place to add more to the simcha. The next day we have Megillah reading again, both in the morning and the afternoon. You only need one of those two. And then having a Purim Suda with the children, with the families, with a Cafe Europa. So please do come and join us. And uh, those are the Megillah reading, the Suda, the other mitzvot of Meshloach Manot, sending out food gifts, and Matanot Lev Yonim, which is, which is distributing money to the poor on, on Purim Day itself. I serve as your agent, and I have people that I will distribute to, so please do um, get that to me beforehand. You could do it online. You could send it to me. You could let me know. I could lay it out for you. And um, that way you will fulfill also that mitzvah of Purim. All the mitzvah of Purim are meant to bring us together. So let's do so. Let's get together. Okay, everybody. Shabbat Shalom and a Purim Sameach, everybody. Again, next Thursday, we will not have um, lunch to learn. We'll be busy with our Purim festivities. Come, come to shul. We'll do it over here. We'll all be together for our Purim Suda. That will be our our lunch and learn, our, our, our Suda and learning. Okay, be well, everybody. Thank you. Good luck.